apresentar cada ah, Não precisa, <risos> isso é um mini curso, não é um seminário, ok? Bom dia a todos. Eu falo português e entendo o português com um sotaque horrível. E então vou fazer o um, um curso em, em inglês, porque em português não vai ser possível, ok? Mas se vocês quiserem, façam perguntas em português, não há problemas nenhum, ok? And please interrupt me uh, when you have questions. That's really important. So I try to be slow and very slow. <laughs> okay, we'll see that. Um, the, the, the first lecture, it's really um, about introductions to, to graph and uh, very, uh, very simple. Ah, está desligado. Sim, está. Obrigado. Okay, so, so today it's introduction and basics. Tomorrow we'll have a practical class on R, R, uh, to, to, to use the concepts, manipulate data sets so that you fully understand what we, we, we are talking about. Uh, then the second lecture would be very simple random graph models, then a practical lecture about applications of those objects. And last part is community detection. In fact, we will discuss spectral clustering only. And then the same practical course, okay? So we have six sessions, three theoretical, three practical. Okay, let's start with introduction. First, I have many very nice pictures of graphs to explain the objects. Here it's a social network. Maybe it's the most popular use of random graphs nowadays. And okay, the, the basic idea and, uh, and uh, this, uh, this uh, graph is that you have entities, which are the, the dots here, okay, which we call nodes, and those entities interact in some way. And these interactions are materialized by uh, edges between two different entities. Here you can see uh, that with this picture there are much more information than just uh, nodes and edges between those nodes. Because for instance there are different sizes of the nodes, different colors of the nodes, different types of links, like here it's black, here it's lighter, so we will see all those subtleties later uh, in that course. Um, graphs can be also um, of, that, of that type. If you think of the World Wide Web, you have um, like, a, um, what is it exactly? So you have uh, web pages and an hyperlink between two web pages is an interaction. But it can also be a physical uh, interaction. Here you look at the internet, so the internet is a set of servers that are physically connected by some, uh, some cables and that convey information uh, so that you can uh, chat with your friend uh, on, uh, on anything or even uh, chat with ChatGPT, whatever you prefer. Um, this is an example of a gene regulatory network of a human disease. So here the, the entities interacting are genes and uh, the interactions are the interactions at stake uh, for a particular disease. Okay? Again, you see different colors, different sizes of the nodes. Um, here there are no different types of interactions, just one type of interaction, but that's the global idea. This is another uh, very nice map, the subway network in Berlin. I could have taken uh, the Paris network but uh, because I, I am in Paris, but I've chosen the Berlin network. It's basically because I have prepared this course with another colleague and she's German. So <laughs> she chose Berlin and I didn't change. Um, another example of a graph, this is the terrorist network of the 9-11 uh, event. Uh, and here uh, you can see uh, that again the nodes have different roles, the edges uh, between the nodes uh, play also different roles. Okay, I could go on uh, like that uh, for a very long time, it's just to give some flavors. I, I will stop uh, on this example because it's an important example. Here it's what we call a bipartite network. 
bipartite network, you have two different sets of nodes, which we call parts. So this is the first part, and this is the second part, and you only have links between nodes in the first part to nodes in the second part. You don't have links within the, the different parts. So here, you look at connections between genes and brain voxels. So whether the gene is expressed in a particular brain voxel in the brain. And so these two type of entities, they have nothing to do. They are in two different parts, okay? But you can look at connections between those two uh, type of objects. You could look at tripartite network also. That's, but it's not used so much. It could, but okay. Uh, people focus mo most often on bipartite objects. Here, that's another example that I like. Uh, it's a trophic network. I do a lot of applications in ecology. And in ecology, trophic networks are um, networks where the entities are species, not individuals, okay? Species. And uh, you have a directed link uh, that indicates who is the prey of whom. So, for instance, all those, uh, those species here, they eat some plants, okay? So this is the, the basal uh, species, the plants, and the rabbits uh, eat the plants, so the, the link goes that way. Uh, but the rabbit gets eaten by the foxes, okay? So in these uh, trophic networks, you have directions, plus you can see uh, what people call levels. You see, they are organized, the, the species are organized in two levels because uh, ecologists, they uh, tend to think of these objects that these are the basal species, these are the first level species, etc. And on the top, you have the top predators, the species that don't get eaten by anyone except humans, which are the top, top, super top predator, but that's not in the trophic network here. Okay, a few words about visualization, because I showed a lot of pictures, but you should be aware of the fact that visualization is a problem, because it might give you a wrong idea about the network, okay? So here, uh, you have two representations of the same graph. That's exactly the same data set. And here, with, uh, with that, with that representation of the left, you get an idea of the object that is completely different of that representation on the right. So, in general, if your graph is very large, you cannot even look at it. But when it's reasonably large, you can look at it, but beware of that. This is another example. These are different visi visualization for the food web, uh, the, the, the trophic network, which is also called a, a food web, from the previous figure. So the one with the species eating each other. So uh, you, you can see that none of it resembles the way I showed the, the, the first time. Here you, you have this idea of levels, but it's less clear in that part the way it's uh, um, organized and in the other representations you you see very different things but again this is the same data set okay of course uh, a very simple representation of a graph is through this object that we called that we call a dot plot so a dot plot is just we will see that object again uh, later but you have the in, in entities interacting, you put them in rows and in colon. And in the cell IJ, you put, a, let's say here, a black dot if uh, node I interacts with node J. And you put a white dot if there's no interaction. So this is just a zero, one valued information that completely characterizes uh, the edges in the graph. So here you have the, the N nodes. Here again you put the N nodes and in the cell IJ you put whether there is an interaction between those two nodes. So you can look at that object as a matrix, and a visual matrix. And here that's the same object, the same representation of the data set where I have completely reordered the, the nodes. And so I kept the same order on the 
columns and the rows because these are the same objects, okay? But just remembering the nodes, I get this representation, which means that here I can see no structure. From looking at that part, I would say, okay, those uh, interactions, they are random. They, the, the, the people in that, uh, in that graph, they tend to connect randomly with the same probability distribution, let's say. And in fact, when I look at uh, the data set in that manner, I see two different groups. So this is the, the first group and this is the second group. And inside the first group, people tend to interact together. Inside the second group, people tend to interact together. And between first group and second group, which is those parts, so it's directed here. So here it's a uh, uh, second group interacting with first group, and here it's first group interacting with second group. You see a different pattern, less interaction, so they don't tend to interact uh, to each other. So that's an important thing that we do in graphs. We, uh, we look at clusters, which are sets of nodes that tend to interact in the same way. We'll do that later in the course. Do you have any questions up to now? No? Okay. Um, this uh, slide is just to show you the different classical representations that exist uh, for graphs. It's not exhaustive, of course, okay, there are many more, but that's the most, uh, the most common ones. We call that layouts, and in the practical course tomorrow, we'll use different layouts uh, to, uh, to obtain pictures of graph. So here in circle, we uh, arrange the nodes into a circle, okay, and we put them uh, in a way that this representation is... Uh, so so the, the, the nodes that are close together, they tend to interact, okay? You don't put them uh, far apart. Uh, that's another possibility, uh, which is called as a star. So here, you take the node that has... I think that's the node with the highest degree. You put it in the center of the, of the representation, and all the other nodes are uh, on, the, on a circle. Again, you put two nodes together if they tend to interact and you, you see the same graph. So this is always the same graph, huh? always the same graph with different layouts, different representation. Here this is random uh, layout, so you just draw uh, the positions of the nodes completely at random in your plane and you, you just uh, uh, draw the, the links and you, you see it's not very clear the information on, on that representation. Okay, there's um, this representation which is called Fruchterman and Reingold. That's very, uh, very, um, how do you say that? Um, very fancy, very most used, because it's based on stati statistical mechanics idea of putting uh, the nodes uh, in the plane in such a way uh, that um, if they tend to be uh, connected, they are close to each other. If they don't tend to be connected, you put them far away apart. And this gives, in general, a very good representation of the object. So very good, again, uh, beware, it can be misleading. Um, there are other uh, examples here, uh, Kamada and Kawai and multi-dimensional scaling. In fact, I don't know the details about how they choose them. I just wanted to show you the variety of different representations that you can have and, uh, and tell you again that this can be misleading. You should be careful when you plot a graph. Okay, the main part of this course is about descriptive statistics. So I want to focus on graphs from a statistical point of view. I'm a statistician. I have this object. I want to describe it. Okay, so we'll start with very simple descriptive statistics. Okay, so basic definitions to, uh, to start this course. A graph, G, is uh, composed by uh, what I called V is a set of nodes or vertices. A vertex is a node, okay? A set of vertices V and a set of edges E. So a edge or a link is just a connection between two nodes. We call N, the number of nodes, the order of the graph and um, 
this is the, the number of edges uh, in the graph is the size. So this notation is for the cardinality of this set, okay? And it's the number of edges in the graph, it's the size of the graph. So as you already saw in the pictures, graph can be undirected. That means that I look at an interaction between I and J, and I don't, I don't specify that the interaction goes from I to J, okay? So IJ and JI, that's the same. They can be directed, in which case I order them. So here you see I have this uh, parenthesis, uh, no, it's not a parenthesis, uh, a bracket, uh, to show that uh, it's an unordered object. And here it's a pair, so it's an ordered object. Uh, the interaction goes from I to J and not the other way around. Uh, the edges can be binary, so then you record the, uh, the fact that the interaction is present or absent only. You put present is 1, absent is 0, okay? But you can have edges that are weighted. So, weighted in which way? You can choose. The most classical way is to put a weight that is just um, um, count how many times there are an interaction, so something which is integer valued, okay? Uh, and, but in general, you, you could have any type of value, W, I, J, which is a value on the interaction between I and J. Again, this can be a value on a directed interaction, you can have all the possibilities. So when W, I, J, the weight of the interaction is an integer value, we sometimes call this, uh, call this a multiplicity. It means that, okay, the, this interaction happens to be uh, uh, mul of multiplicity, two, three, four, etc. Um, but okay, and in general, we call this a weight. So we think of it as positive, but you could think of whatever you, you want. It's not ne even necessarily that it's a, posit it's a positive value. It's not even necessarily that it's a real value. It could be a vector, it could be anything. You put anything that you want uh, on, this, uh, on this interaction. <coughs> and last thing, uh, it can be with or without self-loop. So what is a self-loop? It's just an interaction from a node to itself, okay? And uh, for instance, in trophic networks, uh, you have species that eat individuals of the same species. So that's a loop or self-loop, okay? And sometimes you uh, avoid the self-loops because uh, they don't describe uh, uh, something interesting in your data set. Sometimes you want to, to have this. Um, so it's... Many, uh, mainly vocabulary up to now, but we need those, uh, those definitions to go on with the objects. Uh, then I would say that a node is isolated if it doesn't belong to any edge, okay? If I have a species that doesn't eat anybody and is not eaten, that's not possible, but then it would be an isolated species. I should have chosen another example because it makes no sense here. Sorry for that. And a bipartite graph, we already saw one. It's just uh, that uh, the set of nodes, it's uh, the union between V1 and V2 that have no intersection. And the edges UV are such that uh, they only go from, uh, from one uh, part to the other part. And when I say they go from one part, it's not necessarily directed, but it's between nodes it's only between nodes in the first part and nodes in the second part. You cannot have uh, interactions within the same part. Okay. It's not too fast, not too slow. Tell me. It's okay? okay. Um, so, uh, how do you encode a graph in a computer? Because we will use computer to encode that. Uh, in fact, the most natural representation that we already saw is by the adjacency matrix. So A is a matrix which uh, goes from the set of nodes to the set of nodes. And you put, for instance, one or, or the weight if there is an interaction between I and J at the position I, 
a i j okay a i j is one if i j is an edge and zero otherwise and if you want you you can put the the weight the weight of the interaction in which case we call that a weighted interaction matrix so undirected graphs they have symmetric adjacency matrices because if you have a node between i and j uh, uh, an edge sorry between i and j then you also have the edge between j and i so this results in a symmetric matrix the, that position and that position should be the same um, when graphs are sparse uh, which means that you have not too many edges that's very informal for the moment but there's a notion of sparse graph uh, this representation as a matrix is not efficient at all because if you have n entities in a matrix you have n square values and when n is large encoding all those n squares values that's very huge and in fact um, sparse graphs in the literature are most observed and uh, in, in sparse graph you tend to have a number of interactions that is big O of n of the same order as the number of nodes and not as n square okay so in this case encoding the, mat the, the graph by its adjacency matrix that's not interesting um, the a better way of encoding uh, your interactions is just by uh, encoding uh, keeping the, the list of interactions so you just have okay there's uh, a link between four oh i can't see anything one and four one and two two and and uh, this i don't see Oh, but this is the list I should have run. The, so, okay, this is uh, a graph. On the left, you see its representation as an adjacency matrix. And on the right, you see the list of interactions. So here you see you have six interactions and there are one, two, three, five, seven, uh, seven nodes, in which case I have a seven by seven matrix. So 49 uh, uh, numbers, well, or 49 divided by two, say, because it's symmetric, uh, numbers to, to encode, while here I, I just uh, encode this quantity. So that's really more efficient. Uh, with one peculiarity, uh, if the list uh, um, of nodes, uh, if the list of nodes is not additional, uh, additionally given, you cannot have isolated nodes. So, for instance, if I show you uh, that graph, here it's not completely represented by this set of, uh, of links because I don't know that there's uh, this uh, node here that is completely isolated. So if you want to take into account isolated nodes by giving the, the list of interactions, you should also give the list of nodes. But again, the list of nodes, that's short to encode. Okay with that? Okay. Okay, we start the, um, the statistics. A first statistic that is very simple is the density of the graph. It is defined uh, for, uh, so I start with a simple binary graph. So uh, simple means no self loops and no multiple in interactions, okay? When you have a simple binary graph, so binary zero or one only, uh, then you can see that it has at most n choose two edges. Okay, this is uh, in, your, uh, in your matrix. You just have to encode this upper part since it's undirected and so it's completely symmetric. And so uh, you choose a first uh, node, then you choose another node, but you have only n minus one choices because you don't allow for self-loop and you divide by two. So this is the n choose two quantity. So this is the maximum number of nodes that is possible. And um, so the density is simply defined as what is the actual number of edges divided by the maximum possible. It gives you um, how much the graph is dense. So if this quantity is equal to one, 
it means that all the edges are present. If it's equal to zero, it means that the graph is void. And between zero and one, you have a, um, a graph that could be more or less dense, meaning that it has uh, more or less edges. So the, what we call the complete graph, and we denote it by Kn, that's the undirected graph with n nodes that contains all possible edges. So as I already said, this complete graph, it has density equal to one. And um, this notion of clique will be important also uh, in, in what follows. A clique is a complete subgraph in a graph. So maybe I could have made a, a picture on those slides. I didn't, I'm sorry. So for instance, if you, oops, Sorry, if you look at uh, this uh, graph, say like that, okay, you have a click at those positions, one, two, three. You have all the possible nodes between them, that's a click, okay? Okay. From the density, then we go to the notion of neighbors and degrees. So a neighbor of a node is just the set of nodes which are connected to that node. Very simple. Uh, so if I consider that node number two uh, in this graph, the set of neighbors is one, three, five. Okay, very simple. Then you can define the degree of a node as the number of its neighbors. So here the degree of node 2 is 3 because it has 3 neighbors. So that's how many uh, nodes are connected to that name, uh, to that, to how many nodes are connected to that specific node. So um, we denote the degree by di, so it's the cardinality of the set of neighbors of that node i. And you can see that you can easily obtain that quantity by summing the row of the adjacency matrix. You sum the i row of this adjacency matrix, and if the graph is, is uh, undirected, summing the i row or summing the i column, that's the same. So you can obtain the degrees by just row sums or call sums on your adjacency matrix. That's very easy to get. In directed graphs, you can define in degrees and out degrees. In degrees are the degrees, uh, so are the, the number of links that are coming to you, and out degrees are the number of links that are going from you, okay? And in this case, it's not the same as, uh, uh, as in the previous one, the out degree is the sum over the row uh, in the adjacency matrix, while the in degree is the sum over the column uh, in the adjacency matrix. And uh, is this correct? No, I think I think I have a typo. I need to correct that. So I'll, I'll uh, give you uh, all the slides, uh, but I, I need to correct. But the idea is that for the in degree, you, um, you sum the row, and for the out degree, you sum on the, on the column. So this is what is written here. Degrees are obtained as row sums or call sums of adjacency matrices. And then you could uh, consider the mean degree. So the mean degree is just uh, the average of all the degrees of each node. So for instance, in this graph, this very simple graph, you have those two nodes that have degree only one, and those, uh, so this one has degree two, this one has degree three, as well as uh, node number two, which has degree three. And then you could uh, think of making an average, and this characterize, uh, in some sense, uh, the degree uh, in the graph, and so the topology of the graph. You, we call that the topology of the graph. The sum of degrees will be two times of the edge, essentially. The sum of the degrees will be two times, uh, yeah. So that's, yeah, so that's another way of looking. It is, so since you, you're right, but since you divide by uh, n, and not n and minus one divided by two. That's different from the density. Yeah. 
Uh, I think that appears later, but I, I'm not sure yet. Okay, um, a d-regular graph has a constant degree. This is the case, for instance, if you consider an infinite grid. And imagine it's infinite. Then the, the degree uh, of the nodes is always 4, okay, in, the, in that picture. Uh, so d-regular graph, it's, a, it's an object uh, in graph theory, but in statistics it plays almost no role because no, you, you don't observe d-regular graphs, okay? And uh, the notion of hubs, very informal, not a mathematical definition, a hub is a large degree node in a graph. What is large? I don't specify for the moment, okay? Okay, uh, this is a picture to show you that degree distribution only loosely characterize graphs. Here on the left, you have one uh, graph with a specific de degree distribution. So what I call a degree distribution, that's just the sequence of the degrees. Okay, all those values which are integer valued. Uh, here on the left and on the right, I have two different graphs and the sequence of degrees is the same. Exactly the same, you can compute it. And you see that the graphs are completely different. Okay, but that's the first characterization of the graph, okay? Um, well, let's continue. Okay, another idea that is important is that graphs often show degree distribution with heavy tails. So heavy tails means we have very few, very large values. Okay, you, you, you all, uh, you, you all uh, know about heavy tails in probability more or less, this idea of having a specific large values that, that will appear. So, um, and, and in particular, uh, scale-free distributions that I will describe next, they are known to be heavy tailed and they have this characteristic. So, what happened? So maybe I should have done this introduction uh, earlier in that, uh, in that course. Um, so in sociology, people have worked with graph for many long time, okay, since the 50s at least. But they were working with very small graphs described uh, by and uh, by recording social interactions. And so like hundreds of nodes, never more than that or very rarely more than that. And then uh, at the beginning of the years 2000, uh, people in physics uh, started to, um, to analyze uh, real uh, data sets that were coming from social networks, but from the web uh, era, let's say, like the social network of Facebook, which has nothing to do with the social network that the sociologists uh, could uh, record before, okay? So this completely changed the scale of the, the type of networks people were looking at, and then people uh, wanted to characterize uh, on a very large number of data sets, what happens, what are the characteristics, the global characteristics of, uh, of graphs, real observed graphs. And, and so at the beginning of the years 2000, etc., uh, people focused a lot about the degree distribution because that was the simplest thing to look at. And so in many different networks, they analyzed the degree distribution and they, um, they noted that it's heavy tailed and that a scale free distribution uh, fits very well this kind of data set. Okay? Ah, sorry for that. <laughs> okay, so now um, forget about degrees, let's go a little bit further with paths. So the idea is that when you look at degrees, you look at what happens at distance one from the the place you are standing at okay but from that place i could look at what happens at a larger distance at distance two so for instance one two what happens there so that's the idea of pass and distance that i will define now very um, more formally so a pass between two nodes i and j 
that's just a sequence of edges uh, such that uh, e at t and e t plus one, the next one, they share a node. So for instance, this is e1, this is e2, and e1 and e2, they share, uh, they share the node number three. And I could go there, this is e3, okay? So this is a pass of length three. Every two successive edges, they share a node, so meaning that I can go from one, to one node to another node following that, that pass. And I start at some point i, and I stop at some point j. This is a pass between i and j. Its length is just the number of edges uh, in that pass, so here it's three. And a cycle is a pass that connects a node to itself. So if I go here and here, I have defined a cycle. From there up to here, that's a cycle. Uh, and so here, yeah, I have, I have drawn just a cycle here, and we can look at different paths in that graph, etc. Okay? Okay. Connectivity uh, is defined through paths. So a connected component, which I will uh, abbreviate into CC, is a node subset such that for any two nodes in that subset, you have a path that connect them. So for instance, this is a connected component. But if my graph also had these, so this is a graph, Okay, and this has two connected components because this subset of nodes, anytime I take two nodes here, I can draw a path between them and here the same, but not between the, the two of them. So that's the definition of a connected component. And we say that uh, a subset C is a maximal connected component, MCC, if it is either equal to all the set of nodes or if any time that I take a node uh, in that connected component. Uh, okay, this is V not in, I have to uh, correct that. Any time I take V in V not in C, the subset C and V is not a connected component. So I cannot add anything because formally, uh, the orange graph here is a connected component but it's not maximal, okay? And uh, the maximal would be all this, okay? Okay, an isolated node forms a maximal connected component. That's just obvious. And in fact, any graph may be decomposed into a unique collection of maximal connected component, okay? Here, the, you, you can see the decomposition, that's very simple. In fact, we can prove that there are at most n, the number of nodes, minus uh, cardinality, cardinality of e, the number of edges, n minus e, such connected component. That's an upper bound. It's not the number of connected components, but you can no, not go uh, up to that. That's really uh, an upper bound. And uh, we say that a graph is connected when it has a unique uh, maximal connected component. So here, the graph is not connected. If I focus on that part, that's a connected graph. So in a connected graph, I can go from any node to any other node. And again, but um, this has played a role in the physics literature for a while, and it still plays a role. Um, a giant component in an informal way is a sequence of graphs, Gn, each one having n nodes. So you, you imagine that you have a, a graph and the set of nodes is increasing. So you look at the successive uh, uh, sequence of graphs that uh, this uh, induces. And if you look at uh, Cn, the largest maximal connected component in the graph Gn, you, you say, people say that Cn is a giant component if it's relative size, so the number of nodes in Cn divided by n does not, does not tend to zero as n increase. 
And um, in the physics literature, and also um, from a mathematical point of view, uh, this has been studied, um, uh, people have, um, have um, shown uh, that uh, in some specific settings, you can see the appearance of a giant connected component, meaning that you look at uh, the, the way the graph, uh, the sequence of graph is behaving, and uh, for some probabilities, you have this giant component that appears. Okay. From path and connectivity, I can define the notion of diameter. So the diameter, no, first, sorry. To define the notion of diameter, I need the notion of distance. I already used it very informally, but let me formalize that. The distance Lij between two nodes Ij is the length of the shortest path. So from here to here, the shortest path has length one. And from node two to node three, the shortest path has length four, uh, length two, sorry. I could create a path of larger lengths, but I'm not interested in that. So the distance is the natural way you go for in the short, shortest way from one node to, uh, to another node. Then you can look at mean distance in graph, which is just the sum of the, all the possible L, I, J, and you divide it by N, uh, N minus 1. This is a formula for directed graph here, but you could have the same for undirected graph. And the diameter is the maximal value of the distances. So the diameter of the graph tells you if there are two nodes that are very far away. Okay, and if the diameter is small, it means that any times you pick two nodes, they are very close to, to each other in the, in the sense of the number of vertices that separate them. Okay, so this diameter, it's only finite if the graph is connected, okay, because otherwise in, in this wall graph, uh, the distance from that point to that point is infinite. There's no pass, uh, so I, I, I would say that the, the diameter is infinite then. And um, this notion of diameter is related to the small world property. And again, in an informal way, a graph has the small world property whenever the mean distance uh, within that graph is of the order of log n. And log n, whatever n is something awfully small. You can try on your computer to take very large value of n's, log n will never be larger than 10. Okay, never. So log is really increasing very, very, very slowly. And so it means that anytime you take two points at random in a very, very large like a graph, like the Facebook graph, if you want, Anytime you, you take uh, those two individuals at random in the Facebook graph, they are never separated by more than, say, 10 people. Never. That's really huge when you think of it, because n could be, can be millions. And, so, and in fact, uh, it's known uh, for a while, this small world property, and we didn't have to wait for uh, the, the people in physics by doing this uh, this computation on very large graph. There's a very nice uh, experiment by Stanley uh, Milgram. I think it's in the, before the 50s. Uh, I don't remember exactly. And um, so the, in this small, uh, in this experiment, Milgram uh, selected people at random in the US and he asked uh, one, uh, one person to find a way to send physically sent by mail, by post mail, a letter to another person. Okay, so he, he, he identified two uh, pairs of persons in the US and he chose uh, the states um, in, in a specific way so that they were not so connected. Okay. And, and the two people, they didn't know each other, but they had to find someone they knew, they think would be able to be closest to the goal, okay? And he did that experiment and then he measured something like distance six. 
So that's incredible. You take two people at random in the US and they can send letters to each other by only uh, going through uh, six different uh, posts. So, and in, uh, in fact, in the, there's a modern version of this experiment uh, by Milgram on, on like the, the Facebook data set. And then they found that it's rather three and a half degrees of separation. So if you have a Facebook profile, you are three and a half distance on average from Barack Obama. Me average distance between two people at random. No, 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 no. It's really distance. So how many uh, links separate? Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's really the number of links that separate. So if you want to send a message to Barack Obama by just passing through people that you know, etc., then you'll need on average three and a half person. Okay. So that's really, really, really small. So that means that uh, many uh, real world networks are very, um, very connected, but in some specific sense. Okay. Okay. Now, another notion, the clustering coefficient, uh, which is um, an idea uh, that comes from sociology again and that uh, translates uh, this, uh, this sentence, friends of my friends are my friends, okay? If you have a Facebook profile, you probably know, I don't know, like hundreds of people, but in fact, do you really know them? That's another question, okay? But you, you tend to, to be connected to people you just met because they are friends of your people, etc. Uh, friends of your friends, etc. So let's formalize this in a mathematical way. Uh, if you consider HI the subgraph induced by the neighbors of node I. So I mean, here I will focus again uh, on uh, this node I here. And um, maybe I'll take another color. So I consider that node and the neighbors of that node, which are node 1, 3, and 5. And I focus on the subgraph induced by those nodes. So this is the green graph here. I only uh, take uh, the nodes uh, in VI plus the node I itself. Uh, and I take any uh, two... Um, two um, links, uh, any, any uh, edge between uh, nodes in that set. Then the clustering coefficient CI of node I is defined as that quantity, and this is exactly the density of that subgraph, okay? And so uh, it tells you, so it, since it's a density, in fact, it's between zero and one, and it tells you if your friends tend to be connected. So here, Node i has two neighbors, node 1 and 3, and here those are connected. Here node 5 is not connected to node 1, and neither connected to node 3. So in this sense, uh, so it measures um, how much you have a tendency to close objects like that, so to create triangles in the graph. Okay? Um, and then you can define the mean clustering coefficient as uh, the mean value uh, of all the CI which are defined for a specific node I. And uh, the transitivity is something a little bit different. And tomorrow in the practical session, we will compute both so that you can understand really uh, the difference between those two objects. The transitivity is defined as the number of triangles divided by the number of triplets of connected nodes. So basically, um, the number of triangles divided by the number of things like that. I have two nodes, and I don't know whether there's the, this third link, but they are connected, so the three nodes are connected. And I, I wonder if there's the third uh, connection or not. And so this is very um, linked to sociology, okay? Why focusing on these triangles? This is really linked to uh, 
to this idea of friends of my friends are my friends. But there are other networks where, okay, that you, you could think of looking at other things, but this is uh, mainly, um, this, this has had a huge development because of its rooting in sociology. Okay, so here, just to, to show you uh, the difference between the objects, um, I have two nodes, A and B, that are labeled a little bit differently because here I have the nodes 1, 2, 3, up to N, and I want to think of increasing the value N. So you keep these two nodes free and you add another one node here, n plus 1, and then you will draw uh, a link between n plus 1 and a and b. So you can see the, the increasing sequence. Do you understand what it means more or less? Okay. And here if I compute uh, the clustering uh, coefficient ci of any node uh, that is labeled uh, from 1 to n, the clustering coefficient is 1 because I wonder if the neighbors of this node are themselves connected. So that's always one, okay? That's the definition. Then uh, when I define C bar, it's the average value of uh, CI. So for all those nodes, it's one. And for these nodes, uh, it's not one, but this, uh, when n increases, this can be neglected, the coefficients uh, for this one. So the, the C bar will tend to 1, okay, when I increase that. However, uh, the transitive coefficient t here in this set setting, it tends to 0. Why? Because it's the number of triangles divided by the number of triples that are connected. And here, the number of triangles, it's n, but the number of triples that are connected, you can see all those triples here. There are many, many, many of them here, uh, between 1 and 3, between 1 and n, and this is not a triangle. This is just a triple of nodes connected. And then when you, when you look at uh, what it gives you, uh, you have much more triples connected uh, than the, the number uh, of triangles, and then that tends to zero. So you see that the clustering coefficient and the transitivity coefficient, they measure things a little bit different, but they, they are both related to triangles, but in a different way. Is that okay? Okay. Uh, it's one hour and a half lecture, huh? Is that it? So, Florencia, <laughs> foi embora agora, já não sei. Não, acho que é isso, mas um, do, you, do you need a break or do... That's okay? Okay, we'll do without break and then you'll complain to Florencia. Okay, centrality. So, um, there are different notions of centrality that you can define uh, on a graph. The first one, is the degree centrality. So the degree centrality is just the degree, okay? Nothing uh, very fancy. But if the degree is i, it tells you that that node is central in some way. And in fact, I defined hubs, and hubs are nodes with large degree, and they are central in some sense. If you think of a web page that is very often visited, then it's a hub and it's very central in the wah wah wah, the web wide, uh, world wide web. So that's a way to measure centrality, but we already saw that. And so let's go uh, to other kind of measure. The closeness centrality, which is called CP, it's defined for a node I, and it's one over the sum over all possible nodes of the distance from I to J. So you focus on a node and you look at all possible nodes in the graph. What is the distance to that other node? You sum that and you put one over to make it, um, you, you want to make it large when the degree, uh, when the node is, uh, is very central. So in fact, uh, that quantity, uh, it's defined for connected graphs because if the graph is not connected, you should remember that there are some distances, Lij, that are infinity, okay? 
and then it tells you if from that a node, from that specific node, you can go to any other node quite rapidly. So if it's central in some sense, in, in, the, in the close point of view, so it's not far away from that point. So for instance, if you look at the, at the, um, the network of the uh, train lines in France, you would see that Paris is as a closeness centrality that is huge because the network is organized like that. We have Paris and everything goes from here, more or less, huh? okay? And then sometimes we have things like that, but uh, that's quite rare, okay? Everything is very centralized in France. And so uh, the closeness centrality of that node is very high because from that point you can go uh, very uh, efficiently to any other point in the graph. Third notion of centrality, it's called betweenness centrality. So the betweenness centrality is a little bit tricky. Let me be um, careful here. So I look, at, uh, so I fix the node i and I look at any other pair of nodes, j and k, that are different from that node i, okay? And then I look at the number of shortest paths from j to k, this is this j, j, k, and the number of shortest paths from j to k that go through here, through i, sorry. So, when you have, um, two uh, nodes like this one, i and j. Uh, there, there might be several shortest paths between them. Okay, here that's one shortest path between i and j, but here that's another shortest path between i and j. Okay, so here in this case, between those two nodes i and j, there are two shortest paths and all the other paths are, long, paths are longer, so there are two shortest paths. And uh, the question is, do uh, those paths very often go through that node, for instance? So if you look at the proportion of nodes, of uh, the number of uh, paths uh, that, uh, the number of shortest paths that go from i to j, if they tend to pass all through uh, a specific node i, that means that um, i is in between any uh, two nodes in general, okay? So it happens to be on the path of almost all the shortest paths. So you have to go through there. So again, all these uh, centrality coefficients, they measure the same thing. The, the fact that you are uh, in a central position in the graph, but they measure it in different ways. Okay, with different values. So they capture slightly different quantities, but same, always the same idea of um, are you an important node in the graph? Okay, and last thing here is uh, the notion of motif. So we focused a lot on triangles, but there are specific, there are other structures that could be of interest. And, um, okay, let me mention just one that could be uh, important in the context uh, of um, biology. Uh, in biology, um, there's this uh, motif that is important. It's a directed motif. It's a feed-forward loop. I hope this is in the correct uh, way that I draw the, the edges. I'm not sure, I, but I think so. So the idea is that here you, node i uh, feeds node j, but okay, it also feeds it through, uh, through this uh, node k, but it also uh, feeds it uh, through that node. So that's a feed forward. So that, that plays a role in some, um, in some uh, networks, in, in fact, in biological networks, but there are other, uh, the other type of graphs where this could play a role. So you can look at triangles with specific directions, 
which gives you uh, other motif. But more generally, uh, depending on your problem, you could be interested uh, interested in that kind of motif, that kind of motif, etc. Okay. So what is a motif? This is just a small pattern, a small subgraph, and you want to see um, where it happens in your wall graph. So this is an example of a, a free star motif. So what is a free star motif? Here you have a, a central node and uh, it's at the center of a star and uh, the, the, the star has three peripheral nodes. That's a free star. Here that's uh, also a free star with K, uh, no, not a free star, a K star, sorry with K much larger. Um, okay, okay, this is K equals eight. I've written it here, so I don't have to count. Um, this is a clique, we already saw one, of size three. And this is a clique of a much larger size. It's K six, it's the complete graph over six nodes. Uh, this is a cycle of length eight, etc. This is a, you can see it as a, why did I draw that? I don't know, maybe just to, to show you that you can be interested in any kind of pattern in the graph. And maybe that's interesting uh, for your problem to identify these, uh, these substructures in the graph. So these are called motif. And at some point, people said, um, okay, uh, degree distribution, they characterize the topology, but not completely exactly. Then all the measures of uh, clustering, uh, centrality, etc., diameter, they also capture some of the information in your graph. But it's not, uh, uh, if you have two uh, measures like that that are the same, it doesn't mean that, that the two graphs, they, they look the same. So if you really want to go further, you, you want to capture the topology and the topology is in some sense also captured through these subgraphs, these, these patterns, because the wall graph is just the superposition of these small motifs. So that's why people have gone up to that at that point. I was wondering, I don't make any break, huh? Yeah, that's the idea. So I will be soon finished, but uh, okay. Uh, maybe if in some lectures uh, it's uh, more difficult here, it was quite simple, I think. So you can stand one hour and a half. Maybe in the last lecture we'll break, I don't know, at some point. If, if you don't, uh, <laughs> yeah, okay. Okay, okay, so um, at some point, after looking at degree distribution, uh, clustering coefficients, etc. people have looked at a motif and they have counted the frequencies of small size motif. And that's a way to characterize topology. So for instance, in my bi biological networks, if I have a lot of feed forward loops, maybe it tells me something about the organization of this network. Okay, so that's what I want to capture. Then, uh, when you count these objects, um, uh, so in order to characterize, one thing that people do is they count the number of occurrences of these small uh, patterns in the graph. That's um, not obvious how to do that efficiently from the computational point of view, because you have to enumerate many, many things, and that's difficult. So, the, the, in the literature, you can find efficient algorithms that will enumerate and count the different motifs in a subgraph only for small size motifs. So here it's a motif with order only three. That's okay. So people go to a two, three, four, five, they stop at five. Because even enumerating all the possible motifs of, of size five is quite boring, but then counting uh, how many occurrences of the, those objects you have in the, in the graph, that's not uh, doable uh, in, a, in a very efficient way if your graph uh, becomes a little bit large. So uh, then, um, 
when you count these objects, you want to know if it's large or if it's small. But, but with respect to what? You need a, what we call, from the statistical point of view, a null model. A, a model that describes what you expect. And then you will compare what you observe to what you expect. And you will say, OK, that deviates a lot from what I expect. So with a null model, uh, and we'll discuss uh, null models in the second theoretical uh, lecture, you can test the hypothesis that the observed frequencies of a motif are too large or too small with respect to some expected value. And then you could say, OK, the feedforward loops in this graph, they are really too rare. Or they are really too frequent with respect to what I expect in some null model. And then that's also a characterization of the organization of the graph. Okay, ah, that's all for today. This, this was the, the shortest lectures. The, the ones will be a little bit uh, more uh, important. So I've put references. Uh, maybe we can just use uh, the time left to, for questions if you have some. Otherwise, um, yeah, also. So, if yeah. In the biology context, yeah, the yeah, and you can use graphs in the social context, yeah, because if you don't have this context, it's, it's really hard to study graphs. I agree, topology is depending on the context, yeah. So, so, uh, the idea is to try to develop, um, um, notions uh, that will capture uh, in a very general way whatever the context is, uh, the information on the graph, but of course all those notions they will make sense only in specific context. Okay. I, I completely agree, especially for a statistician. You want to interpret these uh, in the light of the data, so that really depends on what is uh, this data set, what are uh, the interactions telling you wh what they do measure, what, uh, yeah. That's why, for instance, in the bi biological network, the feedforward loop makes sense, but in other context, it has no meaning at all. But as mathematicians, we want to define class of objects that will be useful for everyone, <laughs> hopefully. Yeah, the practical session. Ok, muito obrigada. Sure. Sim, vou, vou fazer uh, correções e enviar, sim. Ah,